Hello, and welcome to Chapter a Day, our study going chapter by chapter through a book of the Bible. This is our study on the Gospel of Mark, Chapter 15, in our series of Chapter a Day through the Gospel of Mark. So let's jump right into this chapter, as it's the probably the key chapter that things have been building for as we've been working our way through chapter by chapter. To give you the background, of course, as we've said in, in almost every session, the goal of the Gospel of Mark is given to us in the very opening phrase of the Gospel, that the purpose of this Gospel is to present the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and what that will mean for his audience once they recognize who Jesus is and why he came into the world. So in Mark chapter 15, Jesus has been arrested. He has been brought before the Sanhedrin at night, and now it's the next morning, and they are preparing to act based on the decision they have made that Jesus has committed an act of blasphemy by presenting himself as God. So starting in Mark chapter 15, And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. So what we see here, Jesus has now been taken to the Roman procurator because for the Jews, though according to the law, they have the power to sentence someone to death for the act of blasphemy, practically speaking, under the jurisdiction of the Roman government, they do not actually officially have that power to take someone's life. Though we see incidences where they were preparing to stone someone, we see those accounts in the Gospels, for someone like Jesus with such a popular following to simply execute him in that fashion runs the risk of bringing down the wrath of the Roman government. So they're going to take Jesus to the Roman procurator to have the Roman government give assent to his death. It's interesting to see what takes place here. Now they've taken Jesus, Jesus who is the Son of God, Jesus who the rulers of the children of Israel, the scribes, the Pharisees, the high priest, if anyone should be able to recognize who Jesus was, it was these men. They do not see it because of the hardness of their hearts, and they take Jesus now, and they're bringing him to a Gentile to have permission to take his life. It's interesting when we see the interaction, which is recorded just briefly here in the Gospel of Mark, the interaction that happens between Pilate and Jesus. Pilate asks Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? So Pilate's question is, Are you the king of the Jews? It's interesting that that is his question based on all that has taken place, because from what we would assume that the chief priests, the council, they're finding Jesus guilty of blasphemy, of saying that he is God. But when he's brought before Pilate and the charges are given to Pilate, Pilate asks the question, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, you have said so which is an interesting statement because Jesus basically brings it back to Pilate. You, you made this, this jump. You have asked this question. It almost appears that Jesus is saying, you actually, if you consider it, you already know the answer. Jesus brings it back to Pilate, as Jesus does to all of us, because this becomes the question. Who is Jesus? From the very beginning of the gospel, we've seen this over and over again. Who is Jesus? Because each of us is called to answer that question. Because the answer to that question will make all the difference. For Pilate, is Jesus the king of the Jews? Because how he deals with Jesus then becomes paramount. For each of us, 
Who is Jesus? Is Jesus the King of kings and Lord of lords? Because if he is, then how we react to him, our actions become paramount. So Jesus pulls this back to Pilate, the question that he's posed to Jesus. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. It's another one of these moments where we see the character of Jesus. The character of Jesus is amazing for people. So for Pilate, a politician, a person whose whole position is based on how well he can navigate the waters of political expediency, suddenly here is this man. He's been brought seeking a death sentence against him, and yet he is not going to get into endless debates and arguments with his accusers. Jesus is who he said he is, Jesus is standing in the strength of his testimony and his character, and he's not going to debate it. Now, part of this, of course, is the fact that Jesus' goal is not to escape what is to come. For Jesus, there is no need to plead his case. Because you see, Jesus has come into the world for the specific purpose of paying the penalty for human sin. Jesus has come into the world to die the death of sacrifice, to pay the penalty for human sin. So in this moment, Jesus is not going to argue and debate because it has already been decided before the foundation of the world what Jesus has come to do. And this is important for us to remember as we see Jesus' actions too. It, all, it portrays his character. It also shows his focus on the mission. That which he has asked of the Father, we saw in the previous chapters, when he came to that point where he asked the Father that if it was possible that the cup would pass from him, but if not, that the Lord's will be done, Jesus is now walking in that strength. There is no wavering now. He is going to the cross. Now at the feast... He used to release for them, that he being Pilate, one prisoner that they asked for. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder and insurrection, there was a man named Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. So I want you to notice what's happening here. We see all these things, all these pieces coming together. Prophecies being fulfilled. The plan laid out before the foundation of the world coming to fruition. We have this incredibly powerful picture here. Because what we have, we have... We have this opportunity for mercy. It was a practice of Pilate, probably a common Roman practice in occupied territories that on days that were of particular significance for that people group, that the Romans would, in an act of mercy and public relations, would release someone that they held in prison, someone who was under the sentence of death, according to Roman law, would receive mercy from the governing official and would be released as a token of goodwill to that people. So we have, it's approaching Passover, this incredibly important feast for the Jews, and so Pilate is going to 
give a gift to the people and the people know this so they're asking is he going to do this is he going to give them their gift is he going to show mercy someone will escape the penalty of death so we have these two individuals we have Jesus and we have Barabbas we have Jesus who is perfect we have Barabbas a murderer we have Jesus who is sinless we have Barabbas who in everybody's estimation would be under condemnation Jesus who fulfilled the law Barabbas who broke the law And what do we see? It would seem logical that the righteous man, if anyone should deserve mercy, it should be the righteous man. If anyone deserves freedom, it is the righteous man. But we see this incredible picture here, played out, moved by human motive, but a powerful picture of a divine plan. So Pilate offers, he says, here, you have your choice. I can release for you Jesus or I can release for you a dangerous murderer a man who does not deserve mercy now the chief priests we're told in the text move the mob incite the mob so that the mob will ask for Barabbas to be freed and ask for Jesus to be condemned they're doing it simply out of manipulation because they want to see Jesus destroyed. But then you see the picture of what's actually happening here. The divine imagery which is being played out. Because Jesus is taking Barabbas' place. Barabbas, who deserves death, He deserves the penalty of death under Roman law and under Jewish law if he's taken lives. He deserves death. Jesus will now die in his place. Jesus, who knows no sin, will now die in the place of a sinner. Jesus, who is perfect, will take the penalty reserved for the murderer. Jesus, who has kept the law, will now take the place of of the one who broke the law. Do you see this is the gospel again being laid out in visual form because Jesus is going to go to the cross where Barabbas should have gone. Barabbas is going to go free. Barabbas is going to walk away free of the penalty of death because Jesus is going to take the penalty of death. Now, this, of course, was orchestrated by human hands, but it is actually the picture of what is intended to happen through the cross. Because Barabbas is everyone. Barabbas is all of us. We, all of us, Scripture tells us, are dead in our trespasses and sins. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, we read in the epistle to the Romans. So this is our penalty, for the wages of sin is death. This is our penalty. We should die. We should receive eternal separation from God. But Jesus is going in our place. Jesus is going in our place. He will die and take the penalty. He will go free. The sinner will walk away a free man because the righteous man has died in the place of sinners. 
the picture of that is powerful. Often we read this narrative and we're caught by the injustice and we fail to see the beauty of what is being foreshadowed even in this human action. And Pilate again said to them, And what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So we have... The picture here. What should I do with the one called the King of the Jews? And the people cry out, crucify him. And again, their motive comes from their hardness. Their motive comes from their sin. But the fact is, It is the reason Jesus came into the world. Jesus came into the world to die, for, to pay the penalty for human sin. So though their motivation comes from their own hardness, they are in fact, without realizing it, they are actually stating what Jesus has come to do. And the power is not theirs, as we read in the other gospels, that no one takes Jesus' life from him. He said, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. So as they are calling out, though it seems like a contradiction, what should I do with the one that you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him. That's exactly what needs to happen to Jesus. That is what he has come for. He has come for that purpose. So when Pilate asks, why? What has he done to deserve this? He has done nothing to deserve it. He's doing this willingly. He's going to the cross willingly. He is perfect and without sin, but he is going to die the sinner's death willingly for us. And the soldiers led him away into the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And he, they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Again, we see this very hard, hard picture to grasp. Those who have experienced Christ's love and his transforming power to read these things, it hurts to read them, to picture what is happening to Jesus. But again, in the actions of sinful men, the truth of who Jesus is is coming forth. So we see the soldiers here They seek to mock Jesus, but in seeking to mock him, they proclaim him. In seeking to mock, they actually proclaim. They take him and they put twisted band of thorns on his head as if a crown. They put a purple robe on him as if he is regal. They place him there and they kneel and give homage to him and say hail to the king of the Jews. But what they are doing in their sinfulness, what they're doing in their hardness, they do not realize they are actually proclaiming the truth. We see this through this whole narrative. Pilate, are you the king of the Jews? The people, give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. But what's he done to deserve this? Just crucify Jesus. Hail, king of the Jews. 
all of this in the darkness of human sin is actually proclaiming the truth for he is the king. He deserves to be crowned. He deserves to be recognized. He deserves to have homage paid to him. And though they do it mocking now, it again is foreshadowing for a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Right now, that which they do in sinfulness is still a picture of what will happen in sincerity because he is. He is who they say and more. He is worthy even as he goes in humiliation to the cross. He is still the king. He does not lose that even now, though they cannot see it, though he is fully man in this moment as well as fully God, though he is going to be humiliated, though he is going to suffer, he never loses the fact that as he is suffering servant, he is still the king of glory. And we see these pictures, these pictures that are being painted even in the midst of this dark hour. And then we come to the crucifixion. They compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he would not take it. So we have these glimpses of what is taking place. Jesus, the Lord of glory, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, who is now so weak that he cannot even carry the burden of the instrument of his own death. And we have this man, Simon of Cyrene, called out of the crowd to assist Jesus to walk alongside him. There's much said in church tradition about who Simon may have been, but we do know that he carried part of the burden for the Lord in that moment because Jesus in his humanity was so weak that he could not carry it, but he continued to the place. We see this picture that as they're preparing to crucify him, they offered him a mixture of, of wine and myrrh, which we understand is actually a bit like a sedative that would cause him to not fully experience the shock of the initial crucifixion because sometimes that shock could be so much that it might kill the person in the moment and the Romans didn't want someone to go into immediate shock and die because the whole point of crucifixion was that it was intended to be a spectacle. It was intended to be a slow period of suffering and death with humiliation because it was intended to be a symbol that would quell any thoughts of rebellion among any people to watch someone slowly meet their death. But Jesus will not take the easy way out. Jesus will not accept the sedative. Jesus is going to experience it all that he has to experience. And they crucified him, verse 24, and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. So as Jesus is there, stripped of his clothing, naked, owning nothing, suffering on the cross, still we have these pictures Regardless of the intent of the writer, here is Jesus. The King of the Jews. Here is Jesus, the King. Even seeing this battered form upon the cross written above him, he is the king. The king who is going to pay the ransom for many. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right hand and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, 
wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down off the cross. So we hear now phrases that were said, that were proclaimed to Jesus as he is dying here. And again, the significance of what's being said should not be missed. We have this statement that's being made, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. This phrase had, had been carried by many people and some had used it as a reason to attack Jesus because he had said that the temple would be destroyed. But of course, when Jesus spoke of the temple being destroyed and being rebuilt in three days, He wasn't speaking at this point of the physical temple, but of the temple of his body. So when they said, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down off the cross, they don't realize that in order for Jesus to destroy the temple of his body and rebuild it in three days, He needs to stay on the cross. Because see, they were thinking again still of the physical temple and thinking of the power it would take to demolish that structure, though Jesus told that a day would come in the future, AD 70, when the physical temple would be destroyed because its usefulness will have passed because of what Christ is about to accomplish on the cross. But his statement about the temple of his body that he would rebuild in three days. Jesus needs to stay on the cross because it is by dying on the cross and then rising again triumphant from the grave that he accomplishes all that needs to be accomplished. So that statement they are making is actually a reminder to the hearers, remember, that statement that they're referring to was Jesus' prophetic statement of what was about to come. So to the Jewish audience who are reading this account or having it read to them, knowing the story that Jesus died on the cross and then rose again triumphant, for them the significance of this begins to jump out. No, he didn't come off the cross. Did he have the power to? Yes but he was determined to see it through, to fulfill what he had said, to accomplish the purpose for which he is going to the cross. And then we see the next expression, verse 31. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He saved others. What they don't understand is that in order to completely save others, in order to eternally save, Jesus will not. Not he cannot, but he will not save himself. For Christ must suffer these things in order for salvation to be possible. So they think of his power and miraculous signs and the things he was able to do to heal the sick, to raise the dead. And they're going, he was able to do these things, but he isn't able to do this because they don't understand that without this, this would not be possible. Jesus will not save himself so that he may eternally save others. And then the last statement we see here from those mocking him. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. 
that we may see and believe. Jesus has already told them that he would not give them that kind of sign, that the sign that he would give, we read in the Gospels, said, for the sign that I will give you will be the sign of Jonah. The picture of that one who went down into the grave and came up three days later with Jonah in the belly of the fish with Christ into the physical grave through his death and then coming out through his resurrection. That they cannot believe if Jesus comes off, comes off the cross without paying the penalty for human sin, then the belief becomes of no value at all. Because we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and upon his finished work upon the cross, and that gives us hope. But if Christ does not die, and if Christ is not raised from the dead, then our belief becomes empty because our sins haven't been paid for. And we have no hope. So their, their call to him is a false call. Their call to him is false because in order for belief to be possible, Christ must die. He must see this through. And he will. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. We see a powerful moment here which helps us understand the message of the gospel. In that moment on the cross, when darkness came across the land for a period of three hours, and Jesus cries out. fulfilling scripture but also letting us know what was being accomplished in those moments in those moments as the land is shrouded in darkness as Jesus is dying on the cross the weight of sin is applied to him. To that scene we see in the Old Testament when the sacrifice for sin would be brought forward and the high priest would lay his hand upon that sacrifice, thereby communicating his sin debt onto the animal that was about to be sacrificed. As Jesus is on the cross in the darkness, our sin debt is being communicated onto him the perfect sacrifice and the weight of that sin debt upon him that sin debt that has caused from the fall forward a separation between a holy God and humanity in that moment Jesus declares that separation my God my God why have you forsaken me because in that moment the weight of sin 
has interrupted their fellowship. But what Jesus is accomplishing as the perfect sinless sacrifice is to take that weight of sin. To take it and pay the penalty for us because none of it is his own. None of that sin is his own. And he can carry it for us, pay the penalty for us. And what we see in that moment as he cries out his last, as he dies as the sacrifice for sin. Don't miss verse 38. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That is huge. Because what we have happening is in the temple, the, the central part of the temple is divided into two parts. There is the holy place. The place only where the priests could enter, where there were the various articles of the temple furnishings, the table of showbread, the candelabra, the altar of incense, but then we have the most holy place. That place where only once a year the high priest could enter, only after fulfilling the necessary sacrifices, he could go in and offer a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people, and he would pass through the curtain. For that one moment, to put the blood on the mercy seat, and then he would have to leave. He could not dwell there. And in the moment when Jesus who had said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment when the weight of sin was applied to him and he carried it perfectly, in that moment when he died as the perfect sacrifice for sin, we're told that this heavy curtain, this wall of partition, in that moment is torn down the center. And I love how it's described. It's torn from top to bottom. As one old preacher has said, as if the Lord of glory grabbed it from the top and tore it asunder. That which has prevented him from enjoying the fellowship of his creation, that separation has now been addressed. And it is now possible for humankind to enter into the presence of God again without fear if they believe on what Christ has accomplished, then the weight of sin that was applied to Christ does not have to apply to us. Torn from top to bottom, the curtain ripped in two. Then we have this testimony. And, the centurion, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. So even a Gentile, even some man without understanding of all that the chief priests and the scribes should have known from the Word of God, just in witnessing what was taking place in the physical realm, made that understanding. This is the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and of Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. It's interesting to see that note from Mark of those who were able to testify to the events that took place that Mark is saying, if you want to know what happened in these hours, you're reading my account, if you want to know, know that there were a large company of women. A large company of women were there. They saw it all. They witnessed it. Many of the disciples may have scattered, but there were women who had followed Christ, who followed him, were there to the end at the cross, who can testify to this as well. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, 
Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he had already died because it was common for people to last 12, 24, even accounts of, of lasting for 36 hours or more on the cross. So when Pilate hears that Jesus, who was crucified that morning, is already dead, he's, he's surprised by this. But it wasn't necessary for Jesus to linger for days. It was necessary for him to carry the penalty of human sin to death. And he had accomplished that. And we have this picture of Joseph. He's a member of the ruling council, a member of the Sanhedrin, but he is also a man who has been looking for the Messiah to come. And he saw something in Jesus. Whether he fully understood who Jesus is, we're not sure at this point, but he wanted to honor Jesus. So Pilate, summoning the centurion, asked him whether Jesus was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that was cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and the mother, Mary the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. So we have the chapter ending with this very somber picture. That Jesus, who had done so many amazing things, Jesus, who had spoken with authority, Jesus, who demonstrated the power of God, is now dead. He's now been taken off the cross, wrapped in a shroud, and laid in a tomb. And the stone has been rolled in place. Where that was, people know. Again, Mark is saying, people knew where he was laid. If there were those who were hearing this going, but where was Jesus buried? Well, we can tell you. We could show you the place where his body was put. But, but this section ends on that very somber note. That Jesus Christ, dead, wrapped in a shroud, placed in the grave, the tomb is shut. We come to this and deal with the somberness of the weight of human sin. That human sin always demands death. And we see Jesus, he who came to pay the penalty for human sin, is now physically dead. He's now been taken down, wrapped, and placed in a new tomb. And the tomb has been sealed shut. That is the requirement for sin. For the wages of sin is death. But the beauty of this story is it does not stop in that moment. As we will see as we go into the next part. I hope as you've been looking at this today and dwelling on Christ and what took place as he headed to the cross, as he gave his life, to see all those pictures, Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews. Jesus Christ, though mocked by men, yet proclaimed for who he really was, though they did not understand it. Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, taking the weight of human sin, bearing that separation that had separated man from God, bearing it successfully as the perfect sacrifice so the veil of the temple could be ripped in two because the separation no longer needed to be there, because people could now accept what was accomplished on the cross for them. Their sins could be removed, and they could be able to enter the presence of God as it was intended in the beginning. I hope this has been an encouragement and a challenge to you. As always, we'd love to hear your feedback. And of course, if this blesses you, please share it with someone else. Thank you. God bless.